with the, inter the co-founders of Interface Fluidix. Um, and thanks very much for joining us. The, we're really excited about this topic because, you know, many of the folks that we talk to on a daily basis have, have sort of brought up um, the complications around PBT reporting and PBT modeling and the challenges thereof. And so we're really excited to bring some expertise to this and um, try and hopefully give people some tools that they need to make their lives a little easier. So let's talk a bit about PBT. PBT measurements have a lot of baggage and a lot of history. Um, and I know this because I'm not an engineer. Um, I don't come from the world of PBT. And through uh, working uh, at Interface here and, and building the company, I've had to learn so much. And just getting into PBT, I, I, put, I put this picture up here because it felt like I had been dropped in the middle of the forest. And you look around and it's you can't see anything except trees. You don't see the path out and you don't really know how you got there. And so it can be overwhelming and hard to understand, you know, how do I navigate through this really complicated session? And so that's really what we're here to deal with today and, and try and address. Um, I'd like to show folks, you know, can we get a path through this? Um, you know, this picture here is, is my wife and my son um, out hiking at Lake Louise. And really my goal here is if I'm, you know, my son in this picture, um, I've got two of two really great mentors of mine on the call here today with us, Marcus and John, um, to hold my, that have held my hand and led me out of the forest and showed me the way um, over the years. And so, hoping that they can share this um, with them uh, and with with you folks in the audience. And and so that's really the goal. So today, what do we want to get through? The agenda here is, you know, we want to understand what are the unwritten rules of PVT reporting that, by looking at the report, you don't even know right? But there's so much mystery, so much hidden behind all this. We want to understand, well, is this measured data? Is this calculated data? Do I care? Um, I want to also understand what are the most important measurements that are buried deep in this PVT report? And is there stuff that is near the surface that I should be thinking twice about or trying to understand the relative importance of? How do I get the most out of this report? And finally, you know, are there new experimental methods, new modeling workflows, and um, new ways of developing these equations of state or these solutions um, to make these things more efficient. And so, you know, the reason people talk, tell me that they, they struggle with PVT um, are these, I'd say these five big reasons um, with lots of um, nuance in there, but overall PVT is expensive. Getting the samples is expensive, getting them prepared is expensive, and then getting the tests done is expensive. Um, once you have that report, it can be challenging to interpret for the, all the reasons we're going to talk about today. Um, and then it's usually handled by some quote unquote expert like a Marcus or a John inside that company, rather than being sort of a generalist tool. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, if you're going to spend all this money and all this time interpreting it, how do we get value out of this data? You know, how do we communicate about the value of PVT reporting? And then last of all, it's just hard. Right, like multi-component thermodynamics is just a complicated topic that you can spend your entire life mastering, or if you want to just try and get value, you can dip your toe in, and it doesn't have to be that bad. And so, with that, I will turn it over here to um, our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Marcus, uh, maybe you can go first. Tell us a bit about yourself and and sort of where you're coming from. Why is why is this important to you? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, so. In many ways, I was kind of born into PVT uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, it's a it's a family business. My dad, uh, Curtis Whitson, um, for those who know, they know. Um, he was, you know, talking about PVT for since I was a little kid. And, you know, I, I went to my first PVT course when I was in my second year of high school. Um, and I still find it challenging to this day. Uh, my background is as a reservoir engineer. And I worked on PVT studies around the world, uh, doing fluid model development. Uh, and my current position is as the product manager for our Whitson PVT software. And you know, that's that's kind of me. Great, thanks, Marcus. John, uh, my name is John Radulowski. I uh, spent uh, eight years at Shell working as a reservoir engineer, eight as a facilities engineer, mostly focused on uh, phase behavior measurements and modeling. I then moved to DBR. Uh, I was there for several years until it was bought by Schlumberger. I moved to Schlumberger uh, and continued to work in the area of fluids more on the research side. 
Yeah. So the reason we've got Marcus and John here today is because while they have a very diverse background and lots of skills across the board, um, we're trying to understand the different perspectives that might be at play when it comes to PVT. You know, Marcus, you live in the world of PVT simulation modeling and, you know, sensitivity analysis. And John, you've, you know, you've gotten your hands dirty over the years, building PVT cells and developing new methods and integrating those into the workflows that Marcus works on. And so I think you both got a very interesting perspective here and, and at the risk of smoothing over a lot of complexity, you know, Marcus, you're here to talk about sort of the, the modeling side of things. And John's going to talk more about the experimental side of things and where those two intersect. And so where we want to start, where we, we all wanted to start today is that not all PVT reports are the same and how they're interpreted affects the predictive power of your equation of state. Um, and so first question, um, we'll start with, with Marcus, just like, tell me a bit about this. Why is this, why do you think this is true? Yeah. So one of the things that we get asked about all the time, uh, kind of on the PVT side is, you know, why don't you just have a standard PVT report? And, you know, that's all nice and well, but different labs do things in different uh, ways and they have different ways of reporting it, even within the same lab and uh, different areas of the world, you know, different locations of that lab or different vintages of those uh, individual labs will be different because the technology changes, right? And, and John will talk more about that. And throughout all of these different practices and the way things are done, um, the you will basically end up getting different types of results depending on the lab and the vintage and the location. Um, and since what I'm trying to do is make a model based on that PVT data, if I have a lot of PVT data from different labs and different vintages, then that will you know, have an impact on the model that I end up with, you know, for the better or for the worse. And so that's, uh, I guess that's the perspective on that. Yeah, John. Um, yeah, and I'll go into a little bit more about the variability in PVT reports. Uh, there is variability in reporting format. Also, historically, there has been variability, uh, not only in the reporting format, but in the methods of the measurements or what measurements are presented. So it's important to look back and look at the uh, vintage of your PVT report, as well as try to understand exactly what the numbers in that PV report, PVT report are. Uh, some reports do not tell you everything, so uh, be a little cautious with some of the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I realized I forgot to, to let everybody know. If you have questions, uh, please type them in the chat or even better, put them in the Q&A portion. The Q&A is open here. Um, we will get questions, I'm sure, throughout this. I will try and answer easy. If, if we can answer one easily as we go, we'll try and do that. But I think we're going to get a lot of questions and we're certainly going to try and save most of that for the end. So as we go, um, type your, your questions in there and uh, we'll do our best to get to those as, as efficiently as we possibly can. So. Uh, with that, I'll keep going here. Um, so, John, I think this is this is really um, your wheelhouse. Can you can you share us? A yeah, bit what's going on here? We'll go into this in a little bit more detail, I think, in the next slide. But these measurements were originally developed for a different type of modeling than we do today. Back when these were made, and I've seen reports back as far as the early '30s, there was not uh, the computing capability that we have today. So most of this stuff was done by hand. Uh, and the models were very simple, and the data were originally designed for use in those models. Um, a lot of the data in PPT reports is uh, calculated or altered, and it is important that you understand which data may be calculated or altered because it impacts the way you, you do your modeling, and, and Marcus will talk more about that. So we really de do need to know how these were how these numbers were altered or calculated and the inherent error in each one of the numbers in order to really develop reasonable models. Yeah. Marcus, you may want to kick in on the uh, models just a bit there. Yeah, I mean, uh, we basically, I mean, use the same models um, since the mid seventies, right? With the Peng Robinson and SRK equations of states, uh, cubic equation of states. Uh, with the addition of volume shifts, uh, they basically at that point, there hasn't really been a need for more high accuracy modeling. 
uh, unless you have very specific uh, calculations that you need to do for like surface processing calculations and things like that. Uh, the biggest challenge I would say is that we have a bunch of the C7 plus components, which we'll get back to, and we don't know what all the properties of those uh, single carbon number, you know, lumped components are. And so using very advanced models will be challenging just because of that. You don't know what you have, right? And you need to characterize that a model. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, this uh, I'll go into a little bit more. It's a, a bit about the history and why PBT reports look the way they do. As I mentioned before, the reports were uh, first uh, composed for a different type of modeling, uh, and the equipment was different. The PBT was performed in simple blind cylinders. Uh, the only thing you could measure was total volume and pressure. That's why in CCE reports, you get relative volume and pressure uh, as a given in the report. The saturation pressures were usually determined by breaks in the PV curves. And a lot of the original oils were lower pressure, black oils. And so this was not actually that bad of a method to get some PVT data. Um, flash tests, either single stage or multi-stage, were used one to uh, uh, estimate what the oil properties are. Uh, the API gravity uh, was an important one as well as viscosity. Uh, and the multi-stage flashes were used to, again, estimate the difference if you would, uh, that occurs uh, when you have a separator and maybe do some separator pressure optimization. Differential liberation, again, was performed in blind cells, and it was used to determine volumetric data during the depletion. And from this differential liberation data, they directly constructed black oil tables for use in things like mass balance calculations. And that really explains that ad hoc separator correction that you always see in the diff lib. It really doesn't have any use anymore because we don't use those tables directly in our EOS model. We use the equation of state to develop those models. And in the equation of state, we put the separator conditions that we are going to use. So don't use that as data because they're not really relative anymore. And as I mentioned before, now we use equations of state. So we use the data that we have in these reports to tune the equation of state. And we generate our black and bald oil tables from uh, these models. Uh, we've had further uh, improvements in equipment. We now have visual cells. Almost all our phase behavior is measured in visual cells. And we can measure phase volumes through concept composition expansion, which is a, a, another nice point to match our models to. Uh, we can get a, an independent measure of saturation pressure, not only the break in the curve, and we really do need that for things like volatile oils and gas condensates. We can also observe complex phase behavior in certain situations. I've seen multiple phases, multiple liquid phases break out, and I can see that in a visual cell where I can't in a blind cell. Uh, <clears throat> and recently, we've, we've had a lot of improvements in automation for standard uh, tests. So it does remove to a certain extent the operator impact on results. It improves the efficiency, although you gotta be a little careful with the algorithms because they may not be sufficiently uh, developed to catch all the nuances that you might see as a human operator. For instance, like a multiple phase dropping out or maybe some asphalt team impairing the windows and things like that. Yeah. So that, that kind of gives you just a little bit of the history. Yeah, I just have one comment here. So great, great job, Don. But and um, one of the things we very often see is that even in modern PVT reports, where we know that the lab is using a windowed PVT cell, the the lab report will typically not have the liquid relative volume uh, reported, even though you know that they have a windowed cell and you know they can get that data. And that's not because the lab is doing a bad job. That's on us to remember to ask for that specific measurement, right? So everybody on the call, the next time you order a CCE experiment, remember that most likely the lab will be using a windowed PVT cell. And if you ask the lab, hey, give me that liquid uh, relative volume as well, then they'll tack it on to the, to the lab report here. So it's also on us to ask for the things that we, we need, right? But I think the the thing I took away from this when as I was getting into the world of PVT and as I think about it now, you know, the I think there's a lot of, if I was to sort of take your words here, John, there's a lot of baggage that comes from the history of how we used to do things that we've improved how we did things in the past. 
but it's been improvement in technological development in a linear direction towards better versions of the previous tests. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah. We do a better job now. And that's the thing on historical reports to remember is the older data, if you get back the 30s to the 60s, there's going to be substantial uncertainty in those reports because they simply did not have the, the equipment and methods that we have today. So if you go to match those, you may have to actually let a lot of the data kind of slide, particularly diff-lib GORs. I'll give you a warning on that one. Full report diff-lib GORs are just bad, usually. <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's let's get into our first uh, sort of specific topic here: understanding measured values versus calculation. You know, I guess the first question: one, you know, what's your one take on here, Marcus and John? Can you is there one property in your PVT report that is actually measured directly, or you know, how much? What's the breakdown here? Yeah, I can I'll let, uh, chime I'll in let you go first, John. Yeah, I can chime in really quick. Very few properties that you see are the direct measurements. Uh, they're, they're modified in some way. Uh, it may not be substantial or significant to what you're doing, but it is not the actual measured value. Densities, uh, oil densities, dead oil densities are directly measured, but even that value is measured typically at ambient and the API tables are used to uh, correct it back to standard state. So it's, it, it has been processed as well too. Uh, gas GC data are directly measured. Uh, oil, and that's for a flash gas, so that would be uh, at ambient pressure. Uh, oil GCs are measured, but there's a lot of interpretation that goes into the way they are presented to you. So the data is, in some sense, uh, altered or, or processed. I won't say altered, I say processed. Many of the other quantities uh, in the PBT report, as a matter of fact, most of them are processed in some way. Yeah. So uh, they may be calculated from other properties uh, or they may be normalized. There's, there's a, a variety of ways they can be processed. So very little is a direct measure. Great. Marcus, anything to add on that? Yeah, so I, you know, for me, kind of the, the, the one beacon of light uh, is always the flash total density. That's that's a number that I, I know in any PVT report I pick up from any lab at any time, that number should be in the report. Uh, you know, John saying that it might be corrected for the temperature, I guess that's a compressive, like uh, slight, slight compressibility thing from the, the temperature dependence. But like that number is something we always know is at least tied closely to something that always is measured. Um, beyond that, you know, the flash gas compositions, of course, they're, they're closely related to something that's actually measured right and, and that's the story you're going to see throughout this presentation it's it's kind of measured but it's also kind of correlated to something that's actually measured right and uh, we'll, we'll see that again here soon yeah so getting into sort of uh, a little deeper on measurements and calculations let's talk about gor and how gors are calculated or measured um in the lab and and some of the big characteristics here i think the as we were getting ready for this and having the conversation, like the question of dynamic versus equilibrium flash and equilibrium systems really came up over and over again. Um, John, why is that something that you've been so passionate about talking to me about? Yeah, it's because there's a lot of confusion around gas oil ratio. Uh, a gas oil ratio may be presented, for instance, in a compositional report, and you assume that's a property of the fluid, but it really isn't. It's a property of the fluid and the process by which it has been flashed down to ambient conditions. And there are a variety of ways to, of doing that. Probably the most common is a dynamic flash. And most of you have probably seen the, the little uh, the schematic drawing of you know, the, the fluid coming off of the single phase cylinder going into a flask where you have a liquid separation, liquid phase drops down and the gas goes on. In this case, there's not sufficient contact and time or area for equilibrium to be established. So it will not be exactly an equilibrium flash. For lower GOR oils, it's closer. For condensates and volatile oils, it's not really close at all. You can do an equilibrium flash, but they're very difficult. There was a piece of equipment at DBR that uh, would do a recycling of the gas through the liquid, and it would approach pretty closely uh, an equilibrium flash. 
So this is a situation where you move from one thermodynamic state to another, and uh, you know uh, it is a, a well-defined state, and that is what your equation of state calculates. It calculates an equilibrium flash. Oftentimes for leaner condensates, we may do a cryogenic flash, either dynamic or equilibrium. And the reason for this is to collect enough liquid so we can do some type of analyses on the liquid phase, um, particularly a GC, uh, a GC run of the liquid phase so we can get a more accurate composition in that kind of heavy end of the condensate, which is quite important for us. Marcus, you know, what's your, your, how does this show up in your world? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm going to give a shout out. I, I saw he was in the chat here to my, uh, my uh, friend, uh, Knut Ullberg, uh, who likes to say a GOR is not a GOR and you better look at the units and make sure what the conditions were to get that. Uh, that's really important. Um, and one of the things that we see is that you need to understand where that number came from, right? Because Every single lab report that has a composition will have a single stage uh, flash GOR, right? And that might be in equilibrium or it might not be, and you have no idea. In most cases, it's not going to be an equilibrium flash. And so you're not going to be able to model that with a cubic equation of state because that's assuming uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. What that means is that if I try to tune my equation of state to that number, I will either be able to predict it and get the wrong equation of state, or I won't be able to predict it with, you know, potentially the correct equation of state. And that's that's a really, really important thing that we've seen in a lot of cases, you know, every, every report has this GOR, you would think that you would want to match it with your model, but if it doesn't, like, if the model isn't representing what's happening there uh, in the system, then you shouldn't match it, right? And the, the way I like to explain it, or, you know, my, my niece and my nephew, right? is that if, if you take a soda bottle and you open it up, you get the gas coming out of solution, uh, it's not going to be in equilibrium, even if I let it stand for 15 minutes, because if I close it back up again, shake that bottle and reopen it, I'm going to get more gas coming out of solution. So you need to know what you're modeling and you need to know what data you're trying to match, because if, if it's not in equilibrium and you're matching it, you're getting the wrong equation of state. Yeah, I'd like to just step in real quick because uh, these flashes are done for compositions. And hearing this, you may think that, uh, oh, a dynamic flash is not going to give you good compositional data. But it actually will give you good compositional data if the gas phase and the liquid phase are homogenized. And you can measure the amounts of those phases that come off. Uh, it will not impact your compositions, but you won't be able to match it with an equilibrium-based simulator. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what you're doing, the reason every report has that single stage flash GUR is for another reason than, the, than making a model. It's to do that mathematical recombination to get an estimate of the composition in your PVT cell. Right, John? Right. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so, you know, as we were preparing for this conversation, and you know, the things that, you know, if I wanted to summarize the the conversation we're having here is like, Really, the takeaway here is for the average PVT report user, understanding which portions of your report are in equilibrium and which ones are non-equilibrium measurements is going to be really important when it comes to actually using the using the data. So, you know, phase volume percentages, saturation pressures, single phase density, and single phase viscosity. Assuming that they were prepared through an equilibrium flash, flash is really the place to go for your, I know this is an equilibrium data set and something that I can try and attempt to match with my equation of state in the future. If you're trying to match things like final flashes during diff libs or any stage during the diff lib, potentially um, simple GORs like a, G, a zero flash or you know last stages of separator tests or, or DLEs, or even again, there's potential to have all of those be in, in non-equilibrium stages if you're not uh, paying attention. Um, Anything else, anything we missed in there, um, Marcus or John, any, any, before I keep going on to an example? No, and I, I just, I want to reiterate this, this distinction between equilibrium and non-equilibrium from a modeling perspective. Whenever you're doing equation of state modeling, it is always assuming thermodynamic equilibrium. So if you're, if you're actual lab process, you can have all the material balance in the world, you know, sum up and everything. If it's not in equilibrium, you're not going to be able to model it. 
So one of the questions we we're asking ourselves as we we're going through here is like, okay, how, what does this mean in the real world? How do I take this, this uncertainty and reflect, what is that when I eventually am running economics, how does, how does that Im impact my ultimate decision-making process? Yeah. So I, I, th this is an example data set for flashed oil densities that are taken from 15 reports in, a, in the same area here. And the circles uh, are indicating calculated densities and the crosses are indicating the actual measured densities. And they're given in the same report on two different pages and they're both reported as oil densities for the flashed oil. And you know the one, you can see that the circles there, it's highlighted on the left plot. It looks like it's falling on a very good, nice trend, right? It's a very straight you know, trend that you're, you're having there. Whereas the other data, the crosses that you can see in the second plot there, it has a much more scatter. And you, your kind of instinct as an engineer is always to take the good data, right? And so you might say, well, you know, that, that's been smoothed by the lab. They've done some, you know, advanced techniques to get that to fall online. But in reality, that's just calculated from a bunch of table values that have nothing to do with your actual fluid. So if you, if you tune your equation of state to give you those flash oil densities, you're going to be consistently one and a half to two percent off, basically um, under or over predicting your your flash oil density. Now, why do you care? Well, that number is going to tell you something about what your surface oil volume is going to be, and the surface oil volume is important because it's used in our BO, right, our oil formation volume factor, which is directly proportional to the um, fluids in place, so the oil in place in your reservoir. So if you're off by 2% on your surface volumes, you know that's going to have a direct impact on how much oil you say you have in reserves, which definitely definitely has a big impact. Yeah. Great. Um, just, I'll just reiterate, there is questions coming in here. Um, a lot of them are going to be challenging to, inter, uh, to intersperse here, so we will get to your questions at the end. I, I see them, and uh, we will get to them, I promise. All right. Another hot topic here, composition. Marcus, I, I, I laugh about composition because I think the, within two sentences of almost every composite conversation we're having, we're talking about compositions. And I think um, I, I have to laugh because it's it's not, I feel, I get the impression you're more passionate about compositions than most other people I, I interact with on a daily basis. Just tell me about that. Yeah, so... I mean, compositions is one of the fundamental inputs to our model, right? It's pressure, volume, and temperature, you know, PVT. That's why we're all, that's why we're all here today, right? But we got the, the ugly stepchild of that PVT is the last part, which is composition, right? We really should call it like PVTZ or PVTX, you know, as Curtis called his uh, PVT simulator back in the day. Um, so compositions do have a direct impact on any PVT calculation that you do. And so we all should understand where that number comes from, right? And it's typically, you know, one of the first tables that you get in a, in a PVT report is the molar composition for sample X, right? Um, and if you go to the next slide here, yeah, uh, what, what I've tried to do here is just make a little bit of an animation showing how a sample uh, is taken, transferred to the laboratory, and it's actually flashed, and you get a flashed gas and a flashed oil. And those are sent into different detectors, giving you different measured properties. So the flashed gas mole amounts and the flashed oil mass amounts, which then go into this complicated you know, mathematical expression here. Well, maybe not too complicated, but it has all these assumptions going into it um, that make up um, that recombined composition on a molar basis. And yes, it's complicated. And why should you care? Well, if there's any misstep along this complicated path, it will have a kind of a, it, it will have a consequence on that final recombined uh, composition at the very end. And so, you know, the reason I get so passionate about it is because like changing or saying that there is a possibility to, to adjust the composition because of all of these, you know, uncertainties along the way, for a lot of people, it's like pulling teeth, 
right? I, I, you know, I can have all the good reasons in the world for why you should change the composition very slightly to get better predictions of the fluid that you actually have. But, you know, it, it's like pulling teeth in a lot of cases. And like that's why, why, why is, why is composition this, this thing that we put on a pedestal that says, well, the, the machine said it's this, therefore it is this, right? Yeah. But that it's thing is that not. What the that's machine, not what we're talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. So what the machine says is something completely different than what ends up being put inside your reservoir simulator in a lot of cases, right? Yeah. And it's one of these things that if you have BS in, you get BS out, right? And if, if your composition input is wrong and you do your model development to the wrong composition, you might, you're going to get the wrong equation of state. You're going to get the wrong model. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because you, you really need to know what's going into it to understand, you know, why we need different equations of states at all. John, you look like you got something to I'd say. I'd like to just uh, interject on two points. Uh, one point on composition is uh, particularly in older reports, uh, if you have separator recombinations, they will do a mathematical recombination report the composition, uh, but they don't necessarily reflash the oil they recombine to check it. Uh, in modern reports, you see that more often. So you don't know for sure in those old separator recombinations whether their recombination ratio was really accurate or not. So it is perfectly justified in, in moving that recombination ratio around if you have significant mismatches in GOR. As a matter of fact, you really have to move the composition if you have mismatches in GOR. The other thing I'd just like to point out, and Marcus brought it up, is the input for equations of state they are mole fractions. Uh, in order to get from the raw GC data, which measures in weight percent, to the uh, mole fractions that you put into your EOS model, you have to make an assumption on a molecular weight distribution. So uh, that's really an important issue uh, that you need to consider when you're putting your data into the equations, uh, into the model, the equation state models. Yeah, Marcus, you hit on this before. Maybe you can walk us through what this graphic is showing us. Yeah, great, great layup uh, for, for me, John, here. So what you were mentioning is that, you know, we have, we're for the flashed oils, right? At least for the heavier components in the flashed oils, uh, C5 plus or C6 plus, whatever it is, we're measuring something which is proportional to the mass amount of those components, okay? So we're basically getting mass amounts and we need to convert those to mole amounts to put them in our equation of state to do any sort of calculation. So how do we do that? Well, we just use the molecular weight, right? And, and those are given in the lab report and we should just use those and, and that's the correct way to do it. Well, not really, because inside of that individual component, so let's say C7 or C12 or C15 or whatever it is, um, you, have, you actually have a bunch of molecules or compounds inside of that single carbon number component. And that's what we're showing here that inside of C7, you have a bunch of these different molecules with, you know, from ranging from benzene to normal C7. And those are all going to have different properties. They're going to have different molecular weights. They're going to have different densities. And they're going to have different critical properties that are used in the equation of state. And the only reason my fluid here in Norway is different from Stuart's fluid in, you know, in Canada is because of the distribution of these individual components inside of the C7, C8, C9, and so on. Um, and that distribution will be different for different fluids around the world. Okay? And one of the things it's going to impact is the molecular weight. So that conversion from mass to mole is it can be significantly different depending on how paraffinic or aromatic that component is. But it, also the EOS parameters are different. And so the only reason I have a job in, you know, making equation of state models and all of that, and we don't just have one equation of state model that matches all petroleum mixtures, is because the we have to characterize these individual components. So the C7 plus characterization and describing that, uh, this distribution of components inside of the lump components is, is really the only reason why I have a job here, right, doing the modeling. And you've written a great blog post over on Whitson's website that uh, we've linked to here. We'll link to in, in all the supporting materials and we send stuff out here. So if you want to go deep, um, Marcus has done a lot of work there. 
Um, you know, I think the last slide here on composition that we wanted to go through, John, do you want to just talk about the practicalities of how GC runs that actually impact the data? Yeah, I, I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, this it shows what a single component carbon number is, uh, and it is really the region between where two normal paraffins come out. So you would have like a C8 and a C9, and the area in between it would be C8, so I believe. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so all those compounds in there are called C8, and they vary from oil to oil. So really what you're looking at when you're tuning is changing your correlations uh, to match the aromaticity of these fractions, because that impacts the phase behavior substantially. Some, some folks talk to me a bit about um, how they act, like the, the practicalities of like the length of time that you're actually running the GC for, you know, is it an hour? Is it a two hour run? You know, how well, you, does that material impact in your experience? You can see here it's running out to at least 42 minutes and still going on. So they are longer runs. Yeah. Um, the other thing is where do you pick your component peaks? Uh if the normal paraffins are there, usually it's picked between the normal paraffins. If you have a biodegraded oil, you have to guess at where you expect those normal paraffins to come out. So those, those uh, components, definitions for biodegraded oils are a little bit more uncertain. So um, the other thing is, is uh, when you go from these components again to, uh, uh, to mole fraction and the molecular weight uh, correlations, they are just correlations. They don't relate necessarily to your oil. If you do have assay data for that oil that you can tie back to these GC data, then you can get a better feel for what the true molecular weight and the uh, density of each individual fraction is. So, you know, the C8 fraction or the C9 fraction, if you do a detailed distillation. Um, you do have to also remember, though, uh, even though we say that the GC separates by volatility, particularly for the uh, heavier weight fractions, you get some smearing of that. Uh, and it's not strictly volatility anymore because the heavier compounds interact with the column, which is assumed to be not interacting. So again, on the various heaviest components, you will have uh, more uncertainty in the uh, actual compositional data due to those factors. So wrapping up our section on composition here, you know, if I give you guys one last sentence here, what's the one takeaway that you want people to remember from this whole section that we've talked about composition? I, I can go first, John. Um, my one sentence is it's complicated, right? <laughs> and once you once you realize that, then you're not going to trust the five significant digits that you have in your PVT report, right? And you will accept the fact that there is some uncertainty, just like with any measurement there is for composition as well. John? Yeah, my, my uh, suggestion would be to always start with weight fractions. Don't start just by punching in the mole fractions you find in a report. Uh, start with the weight percents, and then you choose what molecular weight correlation you want. Uh, and you may have molecular weight correlations that are more appropriate to your oil than the standard correlations they use in the report. Great. Awesome. So all of this talk about sort of how the, the complexity behind actually making these measurements begs the question of, of how do we know what we're looking at is good? Um, and as I was getting into PVT, you know, really people just said, well, the, the Y function tells us if the, if you can trust the data, um, you know, obviously there's a more complexity behind that, but like, you know, that's really the, the next thing we want to talk about here. Like, what is this? Can you just walk us through John? Like what is the Y function? Why does it exist? And and like what's what's the role that it plays today? Yeah, this is actually an older QC. Uh, actually, Marcus dug up a 1951 standing uh, reference for it. I, I the one I saw uh, was in 1952 or three. But the Y function, you can go back as yeah. good stuff on that one. Uh, the Y function is loosely based on uh, compressibility, and it's like a two-phase compressibility. You'll see it reported in CCE tables because really that's the only QC we have on equilibrium of those flashes. Although there are a lot we can do experimentally to convince ourselves that it truly is an equilibrium by watching how the measurements 
how the you know pressure changes as a function of time, for instance. Uh, the linearity has empirically been shown to indicate equilibrium. Uh, you can look at these data and the, the actual bubble point pressure, and there should be a consistency between them. So if you pick the right bubble point pressure, uh, it should all line up on a line properly. Um, and that, again, in the days where you had a blind cylinder where you were looking at a break in the curve, it was useful uh, because your, your bubble point, you may have uh, you know, picked it in the wrong place and it might show up in a Y function, for instance. So uh, it did have some uh, utility and it still has some utility. It should be linear for black oils. And you can, if you have something that's obviously a bad data point, it will fall off the trend. And so, uh, again, it's a, it's a good way to visualize bad data. Um, you can use it for lower GOR systems, black oil systems. It works pretty well. Uh, for condensates and volatile oils, it may not be linear. So you can't tell as much from the Y function for these systems. And uh, you really should never use it to adjust or move your your measured relative volume data, because yeah, I uh, think that's that's the that's the thing that I've you know we've at Interface we've we've seen situations where we receive a PVT report where volumes yeah. have been corrected to make a to get a Y function to be linear, which goes into like well what is the expectation of the person reading the PVT report versus what is the data that was measured, right? Because yeah. If you expect a Y function and you're saying, well, that has to be linear, you're you're going to receive what linear Y functions. If we're willing to address the, or to accept the fact that there's some nuance there, then now you start getting better data. Yeah. And particularly if you have a higher GOR fluid, or if you're considering points near the saturation pressure, because this function gets really sensitive near the saturation pressure, yeah. uh, you don't want to be fitting to those points. You can see here in the deviation and the saturation pressure for this one, that's because the denominator is becoming so large that, you know, it's it's magnifying any sort of small uh, error in the numerator. So yeah. anyway, it's just, uh, uh, just yeah, well, what, you have to be careful. Because you've got some data here for us that like tries to understand and, and sort of go through like some sense. The beauty of having software is we can actually have some sensitivity here. Uh, can you walk us through sort of your perspective on this? Yeah. So basically, I just picked up four samples um, for for PVT experiments, and these are kind of like the four classic uh, types of results that we we see on the Y function check. Um, so the top left one, you you can't really see it, but there's a gray dashed line underneath that that data, which is a linear fit of uh, those data points, and you can see that they're it's a perfect line. It's not like a very good, you know, straight line behavior. It's a perfect line. And that's, for me at least, that's indicating that in this case, they, they measure the data and then they see that they might have a little bit of deviation, but to, to get the Y function to match exactly, they've smoothed the data using the Y function, right? So that's like, kind of like taking the answer from the teacher after the test and then rewriting your, your answer on the test, right? <laughs> uh, and then on the top right, we have an example from the from the Volva field uh, that was uh, you know the data was given from from Equinor to everybody you know they can go in and, and take a look at those lab reports, and um, and what you see here is that they've done a good job. Uh, they have a pretty straight line because this is a you know blackish oil fluid, uh, but there's a little bit of scatter up and down, and so you can actually see that there is this straight line fit, but the data goes a little bit above and a little bit below. So this for me, even though it's not as perfect on the one on the top left, it's indicating that it's a, you know, it's a good straight line trend, but, but it's actual data. Now, the one on the bottom left is, is very common to see. You have a very, you know, straight line-ish until you get right up to the saturated, right up to the saturation pressure on the right. Uh, but what happens with that equation, the Y function, is that once you get closer and closer to the uh, saturation pressure, you can actually have just you know numerical round off because of the number of significant digits that are being used that gives you this extreme scatter near the saturation pressure. And this does not mean that the data is bad. This just means that you don't have enough significant digits to actually match uh, this you know Y function equation. And um, the last 
plot on the bottom right is this kind of like very clear nonlinear trend. And you might say, well, of course, this has to be an example of a bad CCE experiment. But in reality, you can use an equation of state to generate nonlinear, you know, basically parabolic looking uh, Y function shapes for more volatile fluids. So uh, as John mentioned, you know, the Y function should only be used, I guess, for, for black holes. We see that it's linear for a lot of fluids, but sometimes you'll see this nonlinear trend. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the data is bad. It just means that the underlying assumptions in the Y function uh, aren't necessarily honored for that type of a fluid, right? So all of these are acceptable, but they, they look different for various reasons. That's what we're getting at here. Yeah. Yeah. And being able to say that, you know, I think a lot of the things we're saying here is there's, as we go through and I'm trying to understand these PPT reports, it's about honoring both what's happening in the real world and honoring the complexity and the challenge that is generating this data, right? Because it's really, um, there's a lot of, you know, over the years, it's okay, we developed something for a black oil back in the 50s, and then that becomes a standard. And then there's an expectation of what that should look like that translates back into, well, now you're asking labs to make something look like what you'd expected it to be, right? And so there's an economic incentive for things to be the way you expect them to be. And so giving, when you're having these conversations with the people that are doing this work for you, it's, hey, we understand that, you know, being able to say that I don't expect X, Y, Z, or being able to explain why that this, making it a safe space to have these conversations and internally at your oil companies, as well as when you're working with labs, really does bring about a much better outcome if we can mm -hmm. set our expectations to the side and start inquiring as to, well, what actually happened here? Yeah, and before we go on, in addition to things like Y functions, mass balances are often yeah. used as well to smooth or adjust data. And you really shouldn't do that because the errors that are inherent in data are important for the modeler to know. So if you remove them, I have no idea how accurate the data actually were measured. Yeah. Uh, so I may try to fit you know, directly the, the data you give me and it may result in a, a model that is really not that good. So they prefer to have uh, you know, reasonable mismatches and mass balances so uh, that you give information to the modeler that he knows how closely he needs to fit those data. So it is important actually to uh, get yeah. even data that doesn't match exactly, uh, get that to the modeler so he can evaluate it and, and understand what he's trying to match. Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys gave me an example the other day of, you know, in the effort to smooth a Y function, we see um, volumes in a CCE going both expanding and contracting at the same time in one CCE measurement, like that kind of thing can happen. And if you're not careful, like that's the, that's the sort of worst case scenario. Right? Yep. Yeah. You could just imagine pushing those point on the bottom, uh, bottom right plot there. If you push those points down, that's going to have an impact on your volumes. Right. Yeah. So if you're, if you're forcing it to be linear at the end there, uh, then you might get non-monotonic relative total volumes. Right. That's um, yeah. seen that happen before. Yeah. So um, any last words on QA, QC here before we dive a little deeper? I think we're good. All right. So speaking of diving a little deeper, now we're getting into a world of uh, fraught expectations, non-destructive testing, destructive testing, which is important. Where, how do we use the data? You know, there's a lot of complexity here. Um, I think that John, you, you've, you've, you've seen it all in terms of, you know, destructive tests going all the way back to the thirties, like you mentioned through to today, like what, what's your, can you just walk us through sort of your perspective on on this suite of testing here? Yeah, um, non-destructive tests would be things like uh, the CCE, um, and those are nice tests because they're they're very simple. There's less chance for error. Um, you can do multiple tests on the same sample, so I could you know charge the cell. I could run a test at one temperature. I could change the temperature and rerun the test. 
as long as you're not getting something like asphaltene precipitation or some other sort of weird thing happening in your sample, you can keep reusing the sample. Um, you can generate more data sets of different conditions efficiently. So it gives you the ability to get a larger data set uh, more easily and cheaper. The disadvantages is, is, are that we don't have any information about the phase compositions or properties in something like a CCE. Uh, traditional VLE data, which would be the best for uh, equation state tuning, would be data that includes not only phase volumes, but compositions, densities, and other properties of each one of the, the two phases. And you can't get that from a CCE. The destructive tests are usually the tests that are used to you know, mimic a uh, depletion a composition path of some type, and those would be the DLs, differential liberations, and constant volume depletions. Uh, and they are used to follow an estimated depletion path. And remember, that was done because they were used to, uh, to actually make the black oil tables directly, so they had to do that. Um, you can obtain some partial phase compositions and properties. Uh, for instance, in a DL, you can get uh, the, the produced gas uh, composition. And in, if you actually take the time and have a large enough sample, you can also obtain the liquid phase properties as well. The disadvantage of this is, is there are multiple steps. And every time I do a step, there is a potential for error, particularly within the you know, PVT cells, because there are things like dead volumes that may not be accounted for properly. So every step adds a bit of an error. And just, uh, to, just to jump in there, John, can you, when you say dead volume, those of us that don't spend hmm. our lives turning valves uh, might not intrinsically understand that. Can you tell us what that means? Yeah, dead volumes would be volumes that don't really, uh, you don't really see in the cell and you may or may not account for uh, if your cell is properly calibrated, you're accounting for them. So that might be the volume in the short piece of tubing that goes from your PVT cell to the valve that seals it off. There will be some dead volume in that. And in the valve, uh, in piston cylinders, there's likely a little bit of dead volume around that uh, O-ring. Uh, in the piston as well, too. So it's usually, if, in a well-designed cell, it's not that high, it's not that big, uh, and you should be understood. But every time you do a step, you're, you're introducing any issues with those volumes over and over and over again. Uh, the experiments themselves are a little bit more difficult, uh, although with automation, they're not quite as bad now as they used to be. But they are, do take more sample and they're more expensive than, uh, for instance, a CCE. Um, and even though it does follow a composition path that is similar to depletion, uh, the actual composition paths in, in reservoirs during production are not as simple as that. So it, it doesn't follow it exactly. So there really is a trade-off between the quanti uh, quantity and accuracy of the data, which you probably get better in non-destructive tests, and the richness of the data set with the additional compositions or phase properties you may get in the uh, destructive test. But uh, the trade-off there is they may not be as accurate as you think they are. Um, so really, the requirements for the type of modeling you're doing dictate uh, in a large extent what type of data you want to have. Yeah, and I, I think this this animation from um, from our friends over in over at Wits and sort of allows us to sort of confront the realities of the real world compared to you know a nice animation of how does this test work conceptually you know it's great for helping us understand well what are we doing mm -hmm. but the real world intersects with this animation whereas there's things that we're not necessarily capturing right so yeah, well, there's no one no one's showing us where the vol the dead volumes are in here for example. Well, and also in the practicality of the experiment, one thing you don't see here is it just you perfectly remove all the gas and keep all the liquid, which that can't really happen. Uh, you need to push the liquid through the dead volume in the valve, and you need to make sure that there is liquid coming through that valve before you shut it. Uh, because if you leave gas in the cell, it's going to really, really mess the, the experiment up. So we need to ensure that there is only liquid left in that cell. So you do have to account for the little bit of liquid you may lose in that step, as well as any of the uh, dead volumes that you may not actually see uh, in the cell. Marcus, when you're trying to use this data, how do you know 
when you're looking at a PVT report and trying to build a model on it? How do you know that there's issues here or there, there isn't issues, I should say, too? Yeah, I mean, th that's the that's the million dollar question, right? It, and it really isn't like a simple answer for every case, you know, because the, the issue might be different things for for um, different data sets, right? It could be the model that's predicting bad, right? That's one possibility. Or it could be something with the procedure that was not accounted for, right? And so, and you, you don't know, and you can't just say, oh, well, I'm always going to trust the model, right? Which is the intuitive, like the natural thing for a modeler to do, or uh, always trust the lab data, right? You have to seriously consider both options every single time. And one of the key things here is that more data is usually better, okay? And what I mean by that is that if you have a single sample with a single set, like a, a standard PVT suite, CCE, DLE, MSS, there's a million and one ways to, to match that data perfectly, completely independent of whether or not that data is good or bad. But if you have 100 PVT samples with PVT data, it's much harder to, to match, kind of like overfit all of those samples uh, and then you can start, you know, seeing outliers and, and kind of looking for things because you can't just rely on the QCs and the, you know, the material balance and all of these things that we like to do before we start modeling because the labs also have these QCs and they can also go through their own data and say, it doesn't pass my QC. How can we adjust our, our reported values to make it fit the QC, right? So the, the only way you really know is by testing and, and a way to help you um, get uh, less uncertainty is by having more data. Sounds a bit counterintuitive, but but more data you have, the more repeatability you get. And unless the error is systematic, then then yeah, then you, you should spot it. So here here's a question as as I, you know, in my role at interface, we um we do work like this for people. And how do you folks suggest having this kind of conversation constructively with the people that are doing this work with you? How do you facilitate this kind of conversation? Because, you know, the, we, you know, the, we don't want to come in and be like, oh, your data is bad or your model's bad. And then we're just doing, we're just doing this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's, it's about, you know, everybody's showing up, putting their best foot forward. How do you march through that do you have any suggestions on like how do you bring this up to either your modelers or your your testing company in a constructive I, way i think i think having a a good honest open discussion with your laboratory of choice is extremely important right and everybody's going to learn from it if if you're open and honest about it the lab yeah. might find better ways of doing that procedure and the people, you know, getting the data will be happy because they know what's actually happening, right? And so I, I, I really do think that being open and honest and having this like good faith discussion with the laboratory uh, is is very important. I don't know. If you can follow up on that, John. Yeah, I mean, you have to realize uh, that it, 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 you can't do these experiments perfectly. And for instance, like in the stiff flip, actually, if you do, you know, produce some of the liquid out of that valve, if you know how much you can, you know, account for that properly in the processing of your DL data, although the client may not actually know that that is what you're doing, but uh, it, it can be done. So the data you have is actually, you know, good data. I think probably uh, between the client and the lab, you need to understand the reporting. Um, if the data are smooth using something like a mass balance or a Y function, the client needs to know this uh, because it impacts the way he will view the data. Uh, and you know, we can tell as a client, because I've been both the client and the, and the lab, as a client, if I have a perfect mass balance, I know that there's something, there's something off on this. So, uh, uh, but I mean, you can't smooth data using a mass balance in a way that's reasonable. If the if the variation or the error in the mass balance is small, uh, if it's large, you really can't do that. And most labs actually do have internal procedures that you know beyond a certain point they will not smooth the data; they will have to re repeat it. And, and a lot of labs have that instituted, and that should be something also that the uh, client discusses with the lab. 
I mean, yeah, what, I know, I know an interface that. when we're doing this kind of work, like being able to talk to the client about, you know, what is the app, you know, what are you trying to do with this? What is your goal? And that gives us the opportunity to evaluate, well, what is, does our procedures or is the data that we're collecting for you meet that need so that you can get ahead of it and say, well, maybe we have a recommendation or they have a recommendation on how we can work. It's very collaborative is, is what I would see. Um, well, so our question here, can we see the recording later? Yes, it'll be on, this will be on YouTube, hopefully by the end of the day today or tomorrow. Um, so you'll be able to rewatch the whole thing in its glory there. Um, but with that, let's a few uh, start wrapping up the conversation here. Um, the place that I think we wanted to try and tie all of this conversation back to the real world is how does this actually, you know, can we set some expectations around um, what the execution can look like? What is that? What this uh, looks like? Because you've seen a lot of data, Marcus, and when it comes to actually like trying to fit an equation of state to you know, what kind of expectations do you have for, well, does this need to be matching perfectly or, you know, am I, how much error in my, or uncertainty in my model am I willing to accept? Can you sort of give us an idea of what this table is talking about? We're not gonna be able to go through all of the points on course, here, but yeah. like, what's the purpose of this table? Yeah, so so this is by no means a like hard limit and it, it that's not, you're, you're never going to have that. It's going to be dependent on your fluid system. It's going to be dependent on what you're trying to do and, and so on and so forth, right? But what what we're trying to get at here is just like, uh, what properties do you expect to fit better and worse, right? So like flash to oil density, I mentioned that that's, you know, I, I always know that that's measured or it's close to something that was measured, right? Um, and so if, if, you're, if you're deviating a lot on that, that's usually a red flag that something else might be wrong at some place, right? Um, and and also, you know, flash oil densities are important for us, right? And and these uncertainties here are not necessarily on saying anything about the quality of the lab data. It's also indicating a bit, you know, the limitations of using the the equation of state models that we're that we're currently using, right? Um, I think we're we're not going to change away from the cubic equation of state uh, with you know volume shifts because that's what's in the industry and and it does really well for a lot of very important properties but it doesn't do it's not a perfect model there is no perfect model you can have a super advanced model and it's not going to be perfect either so yeah 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 and i think just to you know hit home on that it's like we want to avoid overfitting our data right the trap is if it says it in the PVT report, then it has to be true. And we, I think we've hammered on that as throughout this entire conversation here, but I think that's something that we want to continue to uh, have as a takeaway here. Um, so just a few closing statements here. Just go this, back to that slide. Yeah, yeah, quick, Stuart. I just want to make a point because yeah. particularly people in the lab will have questions about this slide. Uh, yeah. If you look at the viscosity and the measured molecular weight, they have quite large uncertainty ranges. If you look at the accuracy that's quoted by the instrument manufacturer for standards, they actually are quite good and will be a bunch smaller than this. This yeah. is not a problem with the instrument. It's a problem that results because of the complex nature of the crude oil. So okay. you really will get these errors, even though the instrument accuracy in theory is better. Yeah, this is this is a hundred percent like we're dealing with complex systems. And as as Marcus mentioned, like this is not these numbers are not the error on the laboratory. This is the uncertainty that you'd expect to see inside of your model um, when you're using that to try and be predictive. It's like, how predictive of viscosity should I expect this model to be? Not, is the viscosity that's measured in the lab this within this error? So just want to be really clear about that. Um, yeah, so like like I said before, overtuning the model is something we want to avoid um, because it just backs you into a corner where you lose options and you lose ability to understand what's going on. Um, and often these data sets are not being used anymore into depletion or production data, right? We're, we're using the PVT data differently than when it was first conceptualized and started measuring. And so we've taken 
legacy methods and adapted them to modern technologies. Um, and that does come some, with some complexities. Um, so you just have to ask yourself the question of like, are we developing this data for the equation of state or are we trying to follow a depletion process? There is not a black and white answer to that, but generally we're trying to build an equation of state and everything else comes out of that. Um, and anytime we see perfection, whether it's in a model or in a laboratory report, um, it's not necessarily a green flag. That's usually uh, an indicator that we need to look deeper. Um, and then at the end of the day, uncertainty in our PVT reports and our models equals uncertainty in our economics. And so we can't eliminate it, but if we understand it better, we can honor that complexity. Um, any other last statements here before we uh, move on to some uh, Q and A? Yeah, I, I just like to reiterate what I said before. It's it's complicated. That's fine. That's that's the real world. Um, but we just need to make sure to to know what we're doing and and understand where those complexities where those complexities uh, have the biggest impact. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just recommend that people, uh, you know, uh, that use these data sets often and talk with their lab uh, and make sure that you understand what the lab is giving you and make sure the lab understands what you want for your modeling. It, it, that communication is key. Yeah. we The more questions people ask us when we're doing work for folks, the better the outcome is consistently. Um, last thing I'll say is that at Interface, I did mention, you know, we do micro, microfluidic PVT. So we've developed some, some technologies that allow us to sort of uh, try and make PVT more accessible to the world. The reason we're doing this is to try and, you know, do things like reduce sample size, increase the speed that we can get the data, increase the density of the data using these microfluidic tools. And if you're here, you've probably heard of us. Um, and I'll leave it at, if you're interested in learning more about how our PVT systems are different than traditional uh, methods, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, I've got a bunch of additional recommended reading here. Um, we will link to all of these in the uh, YouTube comments or in and as well in the follow-up emails that you'll all receive. So if you wanna do more reading, there's a bunch of papers and blog posts and, and sort of thought leadership pieces. And then if you enjoyed this webinar, um, we've got, um, more uh, webinars coming up here in October. We'll be talking about Sapphire Lab, our, our tools that we develop and sort of the approach that we met and methodology we've had there. And then uh, if you're a PVT person here um, in an unconventional business, you know, understanding completion and stimulation fluids is, is a big thing that we do at Interface. And so if you wanna learn more about that, uh, Adam Fair uh, will be presenting the third in his three-part um, water and chemistry um, compatibility series um, on November 18th. So feel free to uh, keep in touch and we'll, you can register for those. So with that, I'll uh, say thank you very much. And we've got a lot of Q&A here. And so like, let's uh, let's dive into it. Uh, I'm going to turn off the screen sharing and, and so we can just have a conversation here. Um, we'll go from there. That's good. All right. Does anybody, uh, Marcus or, or John, do you have any questions that you saw come in here that you want to dive in first or because I can I can just start going? Yeah, no, I, I saw one question that's related to something we talked specifically about. So, I mean, if if uh, if if you feel like we answered it, then, then that should be fine. But uh, there's a question about the separator test and what's recommended approach for getting yeah. a, a representative recombined reservoir uh, composition. And, you know, since, you know, I can't go two sentences without talking about the uh, the compositions, I want to do that here as well. <laughs> Separator recombined samples are a, like, there are a lot of them. Like, if you go to the unconventional, that's the more or less the only thing you're going to get, right? So it's important to understand how they work. Um, and it's even more complicated than, than the normal samples, right? What I showed was simple compared to the multi-sample uh, ones. What they do there is they take a, a actual sampled separator gas and a separator oil, and they physically mix it in a PVT cell. And, and then they, they can estimate that separator gas composition, that separator oil composition, but that separator oil has to be flashed and then recombined mathematically. And then they can mathematically recombine the separator gas and separator oil uh, to estimate that physically mixed fluid, right? 
But not only that, very often you're going to see that they take some of that sample, flash it to surface condition again, and get it flashed oil and flashed gas, which they measure the composition for. And then they mathematically recombine that. So they have two independent measurements of the same fluid, that physically mixed fluid. And they are both mathematically estimated, and they can be pretty different. Okay. Yeah. It's not uncommon at all to see one mole percent difference in the C1 content. And which one is best? You have to test. You just have to test. You don't know beforehand. Yeah. Yeah, that's a complicated yeah. one. John, you know, there's a question here on good books on numerical computation, PBT, PBT sim. You know, do you guys have your favorite textbook or your favorite uh, light reading material to take by the the fireside when you go up to your cabin, Marcus? I got I got this book here. I don't know if you can see it by uh, by Michael Mickelson, uh, Thermodynamic Models, Fundamentals, and Computational Aspects. By we'll, we'll link to that in the in the in the later. If you're interested in the calculational side, that's a good book to go for. Yeah. Yeah. John? Yeah. And there's some standard texts, I mean, by McCain and Patterson and uh, people like that that uh, go over basic PBT measurements. So that's something if you know, if you're really just starting, you may want to pull out. Uh, and then you may want to look because there's, uh, you may want to look more in, in the literature and pull a few things out of the literature as well that uh, are specific to your needs. So yeah, a, good, a good resource for looking up uh, your references in the literature is the SBE monograph phase behavior by Whitson and Berlay. Oh, that's um, true. Yeah, I, I, have a, I have a copy here next to me uh, signed and everything. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a resource. Yeah, and that is a good resource. I have that as well, too. Excellent. I saw a few questions in here. Uh, folks are asking, can we add the books or links in the chat? Uh, not easily, but we will um, take these notes and share them when we send out the follow-up here. Um, I got a bunch of questions on mud contamination. You know, yep. which compositions should we be using with or without? You know, how do we know what's acceptable? Just can you guys just expand on your feelings on mud contamination and dealing with I, it? I could start. Uh, the uh, contamination calculation is usually done either by subtraction or skimming. Skimming is probably the most common. That's where you assume a functional form for your uh, your you know seven plus distribution, and then you uh, kind of optimize subtracting off uh, the the hump or lump or peaks. Um, they may be a little bit different between the two methods. Uh, depending on whether you actually have a good mud composition or not, and that actually changes over time uh, as they add more things or, or change, uh, you know, add more mud. So you need to be a little careful with that composition. When you do your tuning, you have to use the contaminated composition because you have contaminated fluid in your PVT cell. There's no way around that. So you match that and then you subtract back out the contamination from that model. Uh, and then run it for your predictions, which will be somewhat different than what the data in the PBT report are. Uh, how you model the mud, that's uh, pe different people do it different ways. Some people just will use the same uh, description as the pseudo component where the mud falls in the volatility distribution. Other people may develop separate models and separate components for the mud that maybe are attuned with uh, gas solubility uh, with the mud. I used to do it that way. I, I developed, uh, this was in the 90s, I developed a library uh, for my personal use at Shell of uh, mud components. So that can be done as well too. Yeah, yeah I'll, you know, I agree with you, John. I, I guess you, you meant subtraction is the most common, right? Not skimming. Well, as, far as, as, as far as I know, the, the skimming is where you take two points and you just draw a straight line between them and you say that you just remove everything above. Whereas the right. subtraction, you actually take the mud composition, report it in the laboratory, and you subtract until you until you believe you've removed everything, right? And that's a very subjective thing. Like when do you believe you've removed enough of it? Right. Um, and in a lot of cases, that's just assuming that it's a straight line. Compositions are not always going to be a straight line. That is just a fact. If you've, if you've ever seen compositions for a wide range of fluids, they're not always going to be a straight line. So that assumption is not going to always work. 
Yeah, uh, skimming, a lot of people did do that, and that was quite common, but you have to look at your fluid type. If you have a biodegraded fluid, you will not see any sort of log linear uh, portion of that composition curve. So the subtraction can be... Uh, yeah, even, uh, even... Then, but you, you have to also realize that the mud composition you have may not be exactly the same as the mud composition that's in your fluid because it changes. So, you know, when you get that optimum of subtracting the, the fluid off, it may be a little bit off. So uh, both methods can suffer from problems for different reasons. Yeah. yeah. And, and I typically, we typically like to recommend using the base oil mud composition and not the mud filtered composition if you are going to do subtraction. Because if you take the mud filtrate, then you're going to be removing components that are in your reservoir fluid, like the C36 plus, for example. Yeah. So base base oil composition, not the mud filtrate, if you have the chance. Yeah. A quick question here on bottom hole sampling for unconventionals or multi-rate sampling at surface. I know you touched on this a bit, Marcus, but I think it's, you know, most people are in unconventional places here. Can you just expand on, both of you guys can just expand on sort of like how you, the best practices there, concerns that you might have, like that kind of thing. It depends. It depends what you want to do. If you, if you want to know, if you want to pinpoint what is the composition at multiple depth, depths along a formation that you're producing from, the only way to get that is an MDT sample, right? Or an open hole formation test. I, I, I would say, I think people are looking for, I'm building an equation of state. I need a good PVT analysis. What, what would you say there? Yeah. So so there are the classic papers from Fevong and, and Whitson, and they talk about this concept of a reservoir representative sample. Okay. That just means any fluid sample that comes from your reservoir and that's not contaminated with some outside source. Um, should be able to be predicted with your equation of state for that reservoir. So if you have a separator uh, sample and it's and it's recombined at the wrong GOR, you should still be able to match it. Why? Well, because as you produce your your you know black oil system, as you go below the bubble point, your GOR is going to increase, right? And so you should be able to describe that increased GOR fluid when you go below the bubble point. So this, this concept of a reservoir representative, meaning that it's not contaminated with, you know, mud or, you know, having asphaltine dropping out in the reservoir or something like that should all be, be possible to, to predict. Yeah. John, anything else you want to add on that? Uh, not too much. I mean, it's just that uh, it is better to get samples earlier in the life of the reservoir before you have uh, a lot of phase separation in the reservoir. Uh, just to get a better estimate of what your initial state is. Um, but uh, Marcus is right. If you're if you're tuning your equation of state to match, for instance, the oil properties, they are probably not going to change much over time if you have a, a reasonably homogeneous uh, formation. And again, if, as Marcus mentioned, if you have large compositional variations within your formation, then you're going to have to take point samples with uh, an MDT because what you're going to get or is a um, you you'll get at the surface a mixture that will be a function of the uh, inflow uh, at each level and that may not be constant up and down the level so you may get you know more light stuff for instance coming in and not enough of your heavy stuff to get it. Yeah. The question here that is interesting, uh, we and we talked about before, but didn't get into in the talk here, was around the number of pressure steps, which kind of pressure steps, uh, how many, how to choose them for for your uh, CCEs or DL CVDs, that kind of thing. Like, John, do you want to talk a bit about yeah complexity there? Yeah, I mean, for CCEs, it's not nearly as critical. Um, you want to have large enough pressure step for you. Uh, you know, at least appreciable or measurable difference in things like phase volumes uh, and, and overall volume. For DLs and uh, CVDs, you don't want to have too many pressure steps. If you have a lot of pressure steps, you're going to continue to get that error that you, uh, you know, get every pressure step. So if I have, you know, 15 pressure steps may not be better than five. I mean, but you still need to span the range 
and have enough resolution within the range to get a, a reasonable model for your depletion. But so more is not always better. The fewer pressure steps with large change gives us the best, lets you cover the area. Is that is that sort of the uh, heuristic you use? It's a, it's, you know, it, it, there's kind of an optimum. I mean, you don't want to have them too large because you're skipping over large regions of the phase behavior that you're not representing in your model. Uh, but you don't want to have them too small because you get accumulation of error. So those two things are, are uh, kind of competing and there's an optimum and it's hard to tell exactly where that is because we don't know what sort of error you're getting on each step. Yeah. But, you know, usually about five is enough, I would think. Do you have a different feeling, Marcus? So so I, I feel like on, on the DL, at least, you, you should have enough pressure steps so that you don't run the risk of not reaching equilibrium at each step, right? right. And and I think that's the most important thing. Um, like if you if you ask the lab to do a hundred steps on your CCE, then they're not going to wait until they reach equilibrium for every step because it's going to take forever. So they're they might skimp and you might not get the accurate volumes of those liquids, the the liquid volumes, right? Yeah. Um and like on the DL, we didn't talk about it, but you know, you got this last step where you have the bleeding process, which happens, which is a non-equilibrium, um, which is a non-equilibrium experiment, no matter how you you put it. So if you have too big of a step on the last stage, then you're never gonna be able to match your BO because that uh, that BO takes in that residual oil volume, which is in non-equilibrium, uh, and you're not gonna be able to predict it with an equation of state. So the exact number of steps is, uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, uh, it's hard to put a specific number on it. It really depends how volatile your fluid is and uh, what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, on the DL, I forgot to mention, you do have to, on every step, liberate a reasonable amount of gas to push off. Uh, and if your steps are so tiny that you have just a couple bubbles, you're not going to actually be able to get good volumes. So yeah. there are some practical aspects of it as well, too. Yep. Here's a good question that um, is prescient for the moment here. Carbon capture. What are some of the challenges associated with CO2-rich compositions? Um, you know, now that we're delving into sort of different kinds of uh, systems here. Modeling challenges to address CO2 systems, Marcus? Yeah. So, I mean, CO2 is... Um, a, a little bit more complicated of a molecule than a lot of these hydrocarbon components. I think we, to, to be completely honest, I think we get away with a lot of modeling shortcomings by the fact that we have so many molecules bunched up into these single carbon number components. So we, we kind of get away with the averaging effects of everything happening on the, on the molecular scale. But when you're going to model a specific component like CO2, then it, it can be more challenging. And also the Interactions with water, which is is very relevant for for CCS and and, and also for CCUS, uh, is is challenging, right? But it, it can be overcome if you're you know willing to to make kind of engineering precise measurements or, or predictions. Uh, but if you want it to be an exact match, then then it's it's complicated from the modeling perspective. So. I think ex exact match is not something we're really dealing with in in anything we're talking about today. <laughs> No, no, no. Still, so. if, if you're dealing with CO2 and oils at low temperatures, also you have to uh, be aware of the potential for complex phase behavior where you have multiple liquid phases, which are difficult to handle in most simulators. And you have to do a lot of tricks to get it to run properly and reasonably accurately. But that's really only in oil systems. I mean, uh, for carbon capture, you're, you're very interested in the water chemistry. Yeah. So here's the question we all knew was going to come up. What's are, are you guys aware of any ongoing attempts to replace EOS models with machine learning or hybrid ML bot models? Can I can I take this one? Please. Do. I, I know there there is there is an amazing machine learning algorithm out there for uh, for doing vapor liquid equilibria with a bunch of parameters that are tied. It's, you can almost call it a physics based machine learning model. You know what it's called? It's called an equation of state, right? It's a complex model that that does predictions really accurately. And if it's tuned correctly, that machine learning model can really give you some good results. 
<laughs> so so I, I'm I'm being a bit facetious here, but uh, but it is really the, the case. Like, why would we want to move away from something that is so kind of tied to the physical aspects of what we're trying to understand? Um, to replace it with something that, that we really can't. And and then there's a whole there's a whole you know set of list of arguments for you know we don't really have that big data set when it comes to PVT. And if we're going to train our machine learning model, what data are we going to pick? What data are we not going to pick? Uh, are we just going to regurgitate all the errors that might compile in the PVT report? You know, we, we might end up um, rediscovering the uh, Lee Gonzalez gas correlation, right? Because every single PVT report out there reports the gas viscosities. And so if we chain our machine learning model to get that correlation, then we're just going to get that correlation again, right? So. Yeah, and actually, I'd, I'd like to chip in there as well, too, because I've seen this before where people were using neural nets to generate PVT data, which it, in a way is a, a correlation type approach. The danger with that is, is you don't ensure thermodynamic consistency. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a relationship between all the thermodynamic properties, uh, and an equation of state will maintain that consistency where if you go to more of a pure correlative type approach, you may or may not uh, keep that consistency. And that can sometimes result in unexpected behavior outside of the correlation range. Well, I think the, the comment I'd make on this is I know there's some really good work being done by the folks at Equinor um, around applying ML and, and machine, bit, machine learning to PVT adjacent problems, right? I think the, the the question about AI and ML for me is always, well, what's the application where this is actually necessary? Like, what do we get? What's the orthogonal data set or the orthogonal application that we can actually achieve here? And I think the the approach that uh, the folks at Equinor are approaching this with, which is, well, let's use the giant library of PVT data to try and understand our operational data and understand how we can move in real time because there's no such real time fluid properties is I think a dream that many people have chased over the years um, with you know a lot of a, a lot of challenge. However, with the new technologies and the compute power that we have and, and this technology, we're able to actually like you know finding like oil water contacts and understanding you know what we're seeing and there's there's very definitely going to be a lot more new advancements along that range. And so I would say like, for me, AI plays the role of, well, let's find new ways to understand our systems rather than reinventing a system that works pretty well right now. Um, it's about what's the application for me. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, uh, sir. And, you know, there are certain assumptions that you need to have in place. Like you need to have PVT data that takes a lot of time and money to gather to build an equation of state, right? Yeah. Um, once you have an equation of state, then you can predict uh, new data, right? From GORs, GOR APIs, and so on and so forth. But until you get to that point, having something like you know the mud gas um, predictions tell you something on an operational level, like hey, you're going from a gas to an oil, or you're, you're something is happening in the reservoir, is really useful. And I think that that Equinor has showed that 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 really works uh, on an operational level. So, yeah, 100%. good point. Um, all right, we've got about four minutes here before we're going to lose Marcus. Marcus, are there any questions that you have seen come up here that you want to make sure we get to? Um, yeah, I, I just start from the, the bottom here. If there's a if there's a case where the CCE is enough, um, so, you know, my perspective is also always, you know, you, you need to have, uh, data points along the pressure, temperature, volume, and compositional kind of axes to, to fit your model, right? And if you just do a single CCE uh, for a single composition, then that's probably only going to be good for like dry gas reservoirs, right? Which are already predicted pretty accurately with just a default equation of state because most of the components are already well known. Um, but if you do a CCE at different recombination GORs, different temperatures, then you might start, you know, getting enough data to to really understand and be able to describe that fluid. So I think that's a, uh, it's, but it's still kind of an open question. I think. I mean, or, it's I something, guess you guys we're, it's something we're looking at at interface here as well as like 
you know, understanding, you know, for, at interface, we're very like, well, we're trying not to make the assumption that the testing in the past is the same testing we should be doing in the future. And it's a question of like, well, what do we need to do in order to get a useful predictive model? Um, and so it's something we're exploring is, well, what do you actually need versus what is the, what does history say we should get? Um, without, you know, we're not making any assumptions about that, right? Trying to prove it. Good. All right. Uh, any, do you see one other question that you wanted to answer? A bunch of people asked us about PVT hardware. They're going to buy systems or whatever. Um, I think we'll avoid talking about that. But there's a clear conflict of interest here. Interface would be happy to sell you a PVT system, but um, mm -hmm. there's lots of alternatives. So we'll, uh, if you want to reach out to Marcus or John separately, we can uh, maybe, I'm sure they'd be happy to have that conversation. Yeah. And and if you want to haggle me on my LinkedIn post, then I'm, I'm pretty active there as well. So feel free. Yeah. Excellent. All right, folks. Uh, with that, I think we'll say thank you very much. I know there's still questions coming in here. Um, if you reach out to any of us individually or you send your questions into uh, info at interfacefluidics.com, um, we will absolutely uh, take those questions. And if we can get Marcus and John to give us some input on it. Um, also, once it's on YouTube, feel free to drop, drop questions there um, in the comments on that. Then we'll be able to have more fulsome answers for you. Um, and yeah, so with that, thank you very much. And uh, we will end our webinar here. And thank you so much, for everybody, for attending. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.